Welcome everyone to Serial Bookworms, where we are reading through Mother of Learning a few chapters at a time and talking about them every other week. Feel free to participate, speculate, or ask questions. All I ask is please keep the topic to the current knowledge and chapters if you happen to have read ahead on this story or already finished it yourself. Uh, where we last left off, uh, Zorian had found him had found himself returned to the start of the loop through no action of his own. He believes it's because of his soul bond with Zack, and another loop happens every few days later. It seems Zack is having troubles with something. Uh, surely he won't keep looping multiple times of a couple days, right? Also. The amount of time looped so far is about 14 months. We open the current chapter with Zorian being quite frustrated as he's restarted for the fifth time in as many days due to Zack's trouble with uh, staying alive. Ah, 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 ah. I think we're gonna see some interesting Zorian actions as a result of his frazzled and this mercurial loop situation. Uh, we jump again an indeterminable time later to Zorian letting Tyven into his room for her usual let's go get the adventure party together pitch where he ran into the telepathic spiders. He doesn't plan on going there anytime soon, but doesn't feel good about letting Tyven go and presumably get killed because he doesn't see her anytime in the loop after the E. She goes out to search the sewers. Um... Despite all his time in this loop so far, Zorian still isn't okay with treating it like a given, and he feels awful knowing those he knows might come to harm when he might be able to help them. He talks about researching magical spiders and brings up a couple, a single grey hunter wiping out entire hunting parties, phase spiders which can jump out of a private pocket dimension, and of course, mentioning generally about sentient spiders with mind magic. Tyven dismisses his concerns. Zorian tries to follow up with him having bad feelings about the quest, but this just causes her to get angry and dig in on her decision to go with the mission. Zorian doesn't hear about Tyven after. Take two. Zorian takes a more dramatic tone, using his future knowledge to preempt what Tyven is going to request as a way to try and convince her that he has the power of prophecy. Uh, Tyven, however, is not buying it from Zorian, a friend she's known for years. She thinks it's all an elaborate joke and just tries to figure out how he actually knew she was looking for him and about the quest. Okay, take three. Zorian is staring into the middle distance, freaking Tyven out a little bit. He gravely talks about a horrible nightmare he had about Tyven dying in the sewers goes on to describe in graphic detail dying to a spider attack. His demeanor and descriptions are enough to scare Tyven, and she quickly leaves rather than asking if he wants to join her. Fortunately, he finds out later that she went to the sewers anyway, never came back. Take four! Uh, Zorian claims he's been hearing rumors of mind magic spiders prowling the sewers, and uh, it seems, you know, the government's trying to, you know, put, put a little hush-hush on this information, you know. Uh, Tyven, you may not have heard it, you know, that makes them look bad. Uh, Tyven actually buys the rumor mill excuse and uh, doesn't really have much skepticism on it, but does remark that she simply wouldn't have thought to put on a uh, mind ward when going into the sewer. She goes on with the mission, but Zorian is visited by her later as she complains of wandering for hours in the sewers and not finding anything. Though, indirectly, it looks like he's found a way to save his friend through the power of the rumor mill. It only took a few tries and some lies, but it is a reliable way to save his friend. The bane of all school social circles, the rumor mill. After a short interlude of Zorian being woken by his sister Kriel, this time acting over-enthusiastic to her jumping on him, we come to Zorian talking with the combat instructor Chiron, asking about ways to deal with mind magic. We learn a bit of how the school has changed, as resistance training used to be 
part of the curriculum until some scandals involving teachers using it to punish students outside of usual channels. Zorian ruminates as to how effective it might be and grudgingly feels like it could work, though it would be very repetitive and boring. Chiron sees Zorian's potential interest and pounces on it like a cat that got the mouse. He says he'll go easy on Zorian. And then he casts Nightmare Vision. <laughs> Zorian, silly belly. Have you forgotten the character of the teachers you've been accumulating? Foolish. We have another interlude of Kriel waking up Zorian. This time, he tries to use his unstructured magic to levitate his sister, but there's no effect, and she's just a little confused as to what he was doing. She kind of feels a little tickled. Zorian takes this as a challenge. We smash cut to Zorian talking to Ilsa, uh, one of the teachers, about how he can levitate a person without using a structured spell because he's used uh, an, un uh, uh, an unstructured shaping spell to levitate a pen, spin a pen, etc. Uh, a fun lead-in to him extolling his mastery of all the shaping exercises she put him to task oh, months ago so from his subjective view. <laughs> To the unending list of neat shaping tricks, we now get stone crumbling and north finding. And while north finding is kind of self-explanatory, it's a uh, a way to find magnetic north, um, it turns out that it also improves divination skills, which is Zorian's current action plan. And stone crumbling, that one is even more fascinating. It's talked about that it helps with alteration spells, as it's the first step when restructuring matter is to break down its current state. And it seems this isn't true molecular or atomic breakdown, because most people are happy to get a small rock to break down into grains of sand. So it's, it's a bit more just like molecular restructuring, it seems like. But there's still some very interesting properties of changing the arrangement of the molecules, uh, like silica, off the top of my head as far as like making computers in this setting you know instead of using very delicate clean rooms and carefully acid etching semiconductors you could just magically carve the circuits into a board and the reverse could also be quite interesting turning something from a powder into a solid substance uh if, if you took like a bunch of smoke and then you put it into would you, would you have like a brick of ash hmm Ilsa talks about how Zorian's current skill of levitating from a pen, a pen from his hand, is actually holding him back, because he's still building the levitation with a specific reference point in mind. To freely levitate, like if he wanted to lift his sister off of him for non-specific example, he needs to work on expanding his understanding of references to which the levitation is coming from. And she demonstrates what she's talking about by twisting his hand to the side. And we see the pen flop to the ground because its reference point is now sideways for the levitation. Um, and then gravity grabs it, takes it out of his hand. For a third time, we cut to Kriel waking up Zorian from another loop. And we've had more than 15 restarts since Zack started repeatedly resetting, and it's only been about three days each at the most. Zorian ignoring Kriel during his internal musings gets her concerned she might have heard him, which he rewards by silently staring at her. Before suddenly screaming to startle her, he receives a furious, tiny beatdown while he laughs his sides off. <laughs> We get a couple more one-note vignettes of being awoken before we end up at one where Zorian says that he might be starting to hate her. For us, it's because of this constant refrain of her jumping on him almost daily from his perspective. Uh, but this gets her to immediately panic and start apologizing. And Zorian feels a little confused as to what's going on and asks her what's up. She brings up that Mother wants to talk to him, but he brushes that to the side and wants to hear what's bothering her. At this point, Creel's dam bursts, and she pleads for Zorian to take her to Sayoria because she doesn't want to go to Koth with, with her parents. At learning about this, Zorian is shocked and realizes he's been kind of foolish. 
It's been strange at how easily he could convince his mother to not saddle him with Kriel when going to Sayoria. Uh, he didn't even question it. She didn't want Kriel to go either, and instead made Zorian the one to decide, and thus take all the blame when he always said no. He even gets a little angry as he thinks about all the little ways his mother had primed him to be irritated and more like to reject take, make, taking Kriel, lecturing him about his attire, going on and on about family honor, all until he was in a foul mood before springing the question. Knowing all of this, he now assumes Kriel waking him up and then occupying the bathroom was to force him to talk to the mother sooner, which unfortunately had been backfiring as Zoran was even more irritated at his sister because of that. Shall I assume then that you already have mother's permission for this plan? Yeah, Kiriel confirmed. She said she was fine with it so long as you agree. Looks like Zorian's time in Sayoria is about to have a pretty big shakeup. Or I guess little, since she's a younger sister. Our next chapter opens with Zorian doing his usual routine of filling his room with colored lights to get Ilsa to offer him additional tutoring, and he confronts Mother about taking Kriel to Sayoria. He immediately says, of course he'll take her. It may be biased observations, but Zorian's thoughts indicate he has spent most the most time with Kriel before he joined the Academy, and that he was more of a parent to her than his mother or father were. Hmm. They begin haggling over some extra funds so he can rent a place in Sayoria for him and Kriel. His mother is surprised at how knowledgeable Zorian is of the rent and economics in Sayoria. But we know through Zorian's thoughts that this is because he's planning on moving out of his home as soon as he was able to and wanted to make sure he could afford it. When Ilsa arrives and Zorian inquires about bringing Kriel to his usual academy dorm, Ilsa informs him that this won't be allowed. Uh, she does bring up that she has a friend who's renting out rooms, and her friend loves children and would love to have Kriel around while he was at class. Zorian is cautiously optimistic and decides he'll check out a place. At this point in his repeated looping, he has already explored all of his elective options and just sticks with the choices that'll give him the most freedom, and teachers that tend not to care if he actually shows up in class. When Kriel returns, Zorian prompts her about his books, which she had stolen and hidden under her bed. Uh, she panics at this and makes an excuse to rush back and grab them as their mother asks what's going on. Zorian notes it seems like Kriel doesn't want their mother to know that she's been taking books from his room, which is kind of odd. He thinks there's something significant there and begins to wonder how well he actually knew his sister. We then come to the old standby scene piece, the train ride to Sayoria. This time we shake it up by having a bored Kriel pestering Zorian for entertainment. When they get another occupant, the typical dance of, oh, you're a Kaczynski, are you related to Damien? plays out. We find that Damien is in the jungle looking for something, but not even Kriel knows much. It certainly seems like Damien doesn't have much time for his family, and it isn't just Zorian who's not on good terms with him. Excuse me. Zorian and Kriel arrive a bit damp from the usual rain that strikes in the evening at the place Ilsa recommended and are introduced to Amaya Kurushaka. She immediately sets to mothering them, grousing about kids walking through horrible weather, getting some towels for them to dry off. She seems like a pretty hopeful person, as she's actually helping them before Zorian even introduced themselves, and she just thought they were a couple kids caught in the weather before looking for some shelter. We learn that Amaya's place is not just a rental apartment complex, it's more of a large house that some rooms are set up to be rented out, as two other tenants are slated to join Zorian and Kriella staying there. Zorian isn't sure if this is the best place to stay, and he plans on looking in a couple other places to rent, just in case. It seems Zack has gotten better, or past, whatever his issue was, as Zorian is surprised that the days continue tumbling by. He's going with some of the habits he has formed, talking to Ilsa for advanced instruction, choosing divination, practicing his shaping exercises, uh, scaring Tyven so she'll survive her sewer quest, 
Throughout it all, Zorian decides he's happy with Amaya taking care of Kriel while he's busy with school and studies, and he sticks with the place. Ilsa once again asks him to pick up Kale, and Zorian runs into another interesting change. The place that Kale is staying in is the same place as him! Those two extra tenants were just Kale and his daughter, Kana. And the place was recommended to him by Ilsa as well. Hmm, nice. Looks like Zorian will finally have a very good opportunity to try and get to know Kale better. And the Morlock is much more warm to Zorian this time around uh, because they're staying in the same place. Uh, Zorian also arranges a bit of a knowledge sharing exercise with Kale by providing potion supplies in exchange for being Kale's assistant as he does his mixing. It also helps that Kriel and Kana are only a couple years apart, and the two girls are more than happy to occupy each other. Overall, we finally have a pretty interesting month primed, and it's quite uplifting as we round out this chapter. Going into the next one, we fade into Zorian sitting in Zim's mentorship, dealing with the mana charged marbles. Unfortunately, he still has no bloody clue what Zim wants him and has devolved into just guessing where the marbles are going. After some grousing, we find our perspectives now at the library, with Zorian demonstrating his progress in mastering the library divination skills. He's given a huge box of donated books and works to find which ones are already present in the library by using a catalog tome that has all the titles in itty bitty unreadable writing. But reading the writing doesn't matter because he's got a magical control F to see if the title is already present in the book. And if it is, he can feel it. And if it isn't, well, he won't sense anything and he can set that book aside to be added and sorted. Librarian Kirith Ishil sneaks up on Zorian and is a little disappointed that he's already mastered the divination as he thought it would be a bit of a silly prank and expected he would be manually looking through the tome. She inquires as to the book he's currently reading and Zorian talks about trying to find a book on ancient powerful magic, but nothing comes up. Kirith Ishil is amused at this and elucidates him that ancient magic tends to actually be inferior to modern magic. Spells that are lost are usually lost for a good reason, either due to impracticality rare ingredients or conditions that are longer exist, or they're terribly unethical in modern day. As a specific example, she names off a spell that needed a ritualistic orgy around one specific volcano which hasn't been active for centuries, which calls into question how this ritual spell was developed in the first place? But you know what, maybe it's a good thing and we're just gonna zoom right past that. <laughs> She brings up spells that can be casted, tend to be inflexible and long to use because mages didn't have a repertoire of shaping skills that have been developed. There are hundreds of color changing spells, but most existed to shift to one specific color. Modern magic has been defined by people generalizing their spells and bet mages are better trained for control first. And I think this is an interesting dynamic of old versus modern magic and how things have shifted. I think we'll put a pin in this for discussion after we get through these chapters. Zorian's thoughts give us some interesting historical anthropology as we learn the Ecosians arrived in Latzia after the desertification of their home continent, Mizna. Now, we haven't heard too much about any of these areas, so we'll kind of have to note them down in case we learn more later. Um, it seems part of the desertification may have been magically induced through wasteful magic, which kind of brings to mind modern issues of the environmental effects from forest clear cutting, eroding the usual plants that keep soil in place. So all that useful and nutrient dense topsoil gets blown away, leaving the less nutrient and kind of useless sand behind. Perhaps they were using a kind of plant or weather magic and it built up to macro scale devastation over a period of time. Hmm. 
As Zorian leaves the library, he sees a man who seems like he was waiting for Zorian from the way he, he looks at him. Zorian describes the man as someone middle-aged with a cheap rumpled suit and unshaven, similar to a homeless person, but having a confidence that didn't fit the typical one. And I know it's a brief mention about the homeless people, but it seems eat magic doesn't solve for all systems of government having people fall through the cracks. There are homeless people, and we've seen some xenophobic sentiment regarding Morlocks from other people's reaction to Kale and other previous chapters. It makes one wonder if there are other minority peoples or groups which the Eldamar government has failed or maybe tacitly or overtly are suppressing. And perhaps those people may have a part to play in the invasion situation that's going on. Hmm. The man identifies himself as Haslush Ixeri, a Sayorian detective and part of the police department, the divination instructor that Ilsa sent. Ah, uh, okay. Rumpled suit, unshaven appearance. Looks like we need to turn on the noir filters because uh, let's see where we're going here. Zorian's first thoughts are a little bit of frustration that of all the possible divination teachers Ilsa could have gotten for him, she got someone who works in law enforcement. And that's probably going to be much less likely he can get access to some of the more gray area, questionable, maybe even illegal divination skills that he's wanting to accumulate to better research the time loop situation he's found himself in. Peslush brings up heading to a tavern for them to sit in. Zorian's reactions to the possibility of being taught while in a tavern, a notoriously peaceful and quiet place, definitely not terribly rococious or distracting. Uh, Zorian's trying not to judge Haslush based off appearances as he believes many do it to him and always irritated him by this, but Haslush is making it very difficult. The detective seems to pick up on Zorian's lag of enthusiasm and quickly makes a save. It's not likely you'll be doing anything too serious today. It's been a long day for both of us. I think you're tired. I'm tired. We don't know each other, and we'll accomplish nothing if we just jump straight into lessons right away. Cal, maybe we'll decide we don't like each other and call this whole thing off. So today, we're just going to share a drink and talk. Zorian finds this a eh, pretty fair assessment, though he brings up he doesn't drink alcohol. Haslish asks if this is due to some religious taboo, and we get a little bit of theological world-building crumbs, namely that there were gods and they've been silent for centuries. In Zorian's opinion, humanity is uh, better off, as the gods had a tendency to throw around plagues and curse cities for the slightest pretext. Zorian sums up his situation with bad experiences. Haslush doesn't seem to judge him either way for not drinking, and even mentions he has a spell that he uses while on duty and doesn't want to offend people who do offer a drink, and we're treated to some delightful specifics on alteration magic and its uses. It's a neat little alteration spell that converts alcohol into sugar, Haslush said. Convenient, Zorian said appreciatively. But I thought organic matter cannot be restructured through alteration spells? Usually not, but that's because most of them are impossibly complex and poorly understood. Not because organic compounds are somehow impossible to replicate, as Lush said. Both ethanol and glucose are fairly simple molecules, and quite well understood, so there is no difficulty in converting one into the other. This is... Awesome! I love this synthesis of magic and science, and it's just, mm, mm, it's delicious, it's delicious, I love it. I am feasting here. It seems the barrier to alteration magic is more knowledge, as if they had even more understanding of molecular compounds, they can simplify synthesis through magic. Um, I'm no advanced organic chemist, or generally a chemist in any way, but even with the humble HTO, I think it could be interesting. Imagine an emergency surfacing magic item, so like if you're swimming and diving underwater, and then it will convert water into breathable oxygen by taking the oxygen 
off of them. And then with the leftover hydrogen, it collects those to increase buoyancy and you can just float up faster. Hmm? And I'm sure there's a lot of really interesting ways this can be used to transport otherwise dangerous or volatile compounds in a safer or a more inert state. Once the two have settled down with a drink at the tavern, Hatchless puts up a privacy ward. Uh, Zorian expected an interrogation to begin after that, but if that's what it was, it was far too subtle for Zorian to notice. Eventually, Zorian relaxes enough that he starts to ask his own questions. Like, why is a detective tutoring a third year student in divination magic? A good question. You hear me something like this would be the last thing on my mind, but yesterday my commander dumped a really silly case on my lap. Apparently there is a rumor circulating around the city about endless spiders lurking in the sewers, and I'm supposed to check it out. Uh, uh, yeah, who would, who would spread such a, such a silly rumor like that? <laughs> But we learned that there is a law enforcement initiative to try and get mages interested into the work, which boils down to mages already serving in the force go out and introduce what they do to mages in training on their own dime and time. Yeah, yeah, sounds about sounds about right for a typical top down directive. They make some other small talk and Zorian returns to Amaya's house later, wondering if anything will come about from the spider investigation makes a note to ask Hashlush about it sometime later. Adamaya's uh, seems her place is locked up for the night, and she seems to act more like a mother figure to her tenants than an actual landlord. Uh, when Zorian knocks for her to let him in, she admonishes Zorian for being out so late, not letting her know, and asks him to look into a way to send a message to her and notify her in the future. She talks about Creel asking for Zorian, and he ruminates on the success of the cube he made. Similar to the practice ones he was told about when he got tutoring from Nora Bool, it gave him an excuse to practice spell formula and make a toy to distract his little sister. A smashing success. Until it ran out of magic and the sides wouldn't light up. <laughs> Grail had been reading through Zorian's books and he menaces her plate of biscuits to get her to clean the crumbs out of the bed. She inquires about what a Morlock is, and this is a lead-in to us learning more specifically about those people. They tend to have white hair and blue eyes, and Zorian expands on that little physical uh, characteristics we know about to talk about how they are actually humans that used to live underground. The gods disappearing apparently hit them particularly hard, and they were driven out of the dungeon and onto the surface. It also sounds like they're much more native to the region than the Ecosians, who were settlers that make up the current Eldamar Empire, as he talks about the settlers raising Morlock settlements. Creel is a bit confused as to why people don't like them. It's a, kind of a credit to her that even she can tell that it seems like Morlock should be the angry people in this situation. Zorian concedes that some of the ancient Morlock customs for their gods apparently involved some amount of cannibalism? Allegedly. Because the source of this? Uh, the Ecosian settlers. Hmm. Yeah, a colonizing force demonizing the native peoples and not trying to actually understand their culture? Gee, never heard a page from that playbook before. Hmm. But beyond the ancient history, it does seem they have their own kind of magic, and it's lumped under the umbrella of blood magic. There's still no official information as to what it is, just stories about ritualistic killings of people to power spells. And there's rumors that some Morlocks engage in animal sacrifice for magical or religious purpose. With Zorian trying to get to know Kale better, perhaps eventually we'll learn something more concrete from the voice of an actual Morlock, and not this wild mass speculation, but we kind of now have a general framework for how Morlocks are known by as unpleasant and distasteful and quite biased as it is. We close out the chapter with Creel and Zorian snuggling up cozy, a nice contrast to the usual shtick of Zorian being shocked awake by his sister jumping on him. And that's going to be where our chapter recap comes to an end. 
And I kind of wanted to bring up the dynamic of the old magic and modern magic. So the old magic was described as very hyper specific. It's very inflexible. It has like a single focus. Whereas modern magic being more generalized, it requires more precision. It's more flexible. You know, I, I have a very IT broad background. And so that's sort of how I'm thinking of sort of like how a lot of technology has evolved. So you can maybe think of like old, uh, old, uh, uh, tools and, um, programs we might use, you know, they might be very simple. They might have very, uh, like a singular use. And then as we've advanced through the years, a lot of programs have started to get a lot more complex. You know, you have to know a lot more to fit all these various things together to get them to work, but they're much more robust. Um, you can, you can, it, you can see it sort of, uh, like I remember when I used to try and make like a simple website, you know, I would just open up a notepad and just put in a couple things. And then these days you have like entire ecosystems of programs and applications and frameworks to build and manage a website to display graphics and handle with authentication and you know it's it's sort of a situation where there are certain reasons where you might need something highly specific something very simple to get something done but nowadays our general level of education our general level of ability to learn and find information allows us to be better informed and able to take advantage of advances in utilizing these systems that we interact with. You know, you could think of like even like programming languages, you know, you have your old like your typical COBOL or your assembly languages that are very low level, you know, they're just interacting with the hardware and then a much more modern language, you know, all of that very specific stuff that's highly, you know, specific uh, uh, operations and commands has been abstracted up to like we can type readable text to get the effect happening rather than pushing and pulling individual bits to get something to occur and I think it's going to be kind of interesting to see if throughout these time loops Zorian's ability to learn all of these spells from these various uh, teachers and specialists in different fields, if at some point we start seeing Zornian developing his own original magic, you know, synthesizing all of these uh, depths of knowledge in a variety of magical fields and utilizing them in a unique and innovative way, because, you know, this world is still in a little bit of a late industrial revolution, I would say, maybe? Or maybe, maybe not exactly industrial revolution because they do have, so like the, the trains that Zorian has been taking to Sayoria, they're still, it's like the, it's like a second generation magic train, you know, it's running off of a crystallized mana resource to run the train, but it's still, a, it's still a train, you know, instead of coal, we've got magic, you know? Uh, so there's plenty of room for magic and technology to advance in ways that you know technology that we are very familiar with but with a magical spin to this setting 